We are, we Christians, are the biggest faith group in the world. Christianity is still twice the size of the next religion at this point. And the only way that we're going to break this is not to say, what am I, what's wrong with you secular people? Why are you being so mean to us? Christians have to recognize, number one, that you're a big part of the problem, and number two, that we also can be at the heart of the solution. There are two basic ways of thinking about your self-image. One is what I'm going to call a moral performance narrative. A moral performance narrative says, I'm okay, I'm a good person, I feel significant, and I have worth because I'm achieving something. So if you are a liberal person, and you feel like I'm a good person because I'm working for the poor, and I'm working for human rights, and I'm open-minded, you can't help in a moral performance narrative. Your self-image is based on your performance as a, a, a generous, liberal, activist person. You can't help but look down your nose at bigots. You can't help but feel superior to bigots. On the other hand, what if you are a traditional religious person and you go to church and you read your Bible, or you go to synagogue and you read your Bible, or you go to the mosque and read the Quran, and, and you're working really hard to be good and to serve God, etc. Now in that case, you have to look down your nose at people uh, who don't believe your religion, and they're not being as good as you are. And maybe you're just a secular person and you're a hardworking, decent chap. You can't help, if your self-image is based on the idea that you're a hardworking, decent chap, you can't help but look down your nose at people who you consider lazy. But the gospel, the gospel is something different. The gospel says Jesus Christ comes and saves you. Uh, the gospel says you're a sinner. The gospel says you don't live up to your own standards. The gospel says that you have failed, you're a moral failure, and salvation only belongs to people who admit their moral failures. And Jesus came in weakness and died on the cross. And he says, my salvation is only to weak people. It only is there for people who admit that you're not better than anyone else, that you just need mercy. If you have a grace narrative, if you say the reason I can look myself in the mirror, the reason I know I have significance is because Jesus died for me, though I'm a sinner saved by grace, you can't feel superior to anybody. I mean, I've got a Hindu neighbor in my apartment building. And I think he's wrong about the Trinity. I think he's wrong about a lot of things. But he could be, he probably is a better father than me. He's probably, he could be a much better man. Why? Why aren't you a Christian? He's a Hindu. Don't you think you have the truth? Yeah, but here's the truth. The truth is I'm a sinner and I'm saved by grace. So why in the world? I'm not saved because I'm a better man. I'm saved because I'm a worse man. And I, really? And so what happens is the grace narrative takes away the kind of superiority and removes that slippery slope that leads from superiority to separation to caricature and to passive and then active oppression. It just takes it away. Now, Christians have got to admit that to a great degree we operate out of the moral performance narrative, and we don't have to because we got the gospel. And yet to a great degree we do. But let me tell you what happens when the grace narrative is really ascendant. You go back to the earliest days of the church. Here's the Roman Empire, the Greco-Roman Empire, and they believed in pluralism. They didn't believe there was any one God. Everybody had their own God, right? Open-minded. Along come the Christians and they say, Jesus is the true God. Very, very rigid. And yet the lives of the pagans and the Christians were different. The pagans looked down their nose at the poor. Christians loved the poor. The pagans were very stratified. They never mixed different classes and social strata. Christians got everybody together, races together, classes together. Pagans were extremely oppressive to women. Christians were much more open to uh, the leadership of women. Why would what looks like an open-minded philosophy lead to so much oppressiveness, and what over here, the Christian, looks like a rigid philosophy lead to so much peacemaking and so much generosity? And I remember uh, not long after 9-11, I was reading an editorial to my wife out of the Sunday morning paper that says, you know what the problem with the world is? Fundamentalism. If you're a fundamentalist, it's going to lead to, to violence. But uh, when my wife sat there and she says, that's ridiculous. It all depends on what the fundamental is. She says, have you ever seen an Amish terrorist? If, listen, if Amish aren't fundamentalists, there ain't no such thing. <laughs> but here's what their fundamental is. A man dying on the cross for his enemies. 
a man praying for the forgiveness of his enemies as he's dying. If that's at the very center of your life, that destroys the slippery slope. You, need, you don't need less Christianity, you need real Christianity.